The following program may contain coarse language, violence, nudity, mature subject matter, or scenes which may not be suitable for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. All hit radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And good evening, one and all. This is the X Zone. I am Rob McConnell coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. Now, if you'd like to send me an email, it's Mr. X at X Zone Radio TV.com on all social media sites, X Zone Radio TV. And we're coming to you tonight around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, X Zone Broadcast Network, and of course, on Channel. 32 on Simul TV at www.simultv.com. And for all our American uh, viewers who would like to still continue to get Canadian media, even though Facebook, Google, and other social media platforms are going to be cutting us off, just go to www.canadiannewsnetwork.net. All the links to the Canadian media. Um, business all our radio tv and newspapers are right there exo nation my guest this hour is a gentleman i've had the pleasure of knowing for a number of years one of the very few people in this industry i really respect and i'm talking about our guest this hour dr john brandenburg we're going to be speaking to john about his two new papers as well as well i i'm going to bring john on and we're going to let him uh, share the stage hey john how are you buddy hey great to be here ron a pleasure and an honor always to be uh, on your show Thank you very much, uh, John. For the listeners and the viewers who may be dropping into the X Zone for the first time tonight, and they're saying, John Brandenburg, who is John Brandenburg, and what does John Brandenburg do? So, why don't you tell us? Ex introduce well, yourself, I, my friend. I am primarily a plasma physicist. I deal with uh, hot gas like the stuff of stars, the northern mm -hmm. lights, which you Canadians are very familiar with. Oh, yeah. And uh, the uh, lightning bolts and uh, controlled fusion inside tokamaks. So that's what um, plasmas are, but you can also use them for advanced space propulsion. And uh, I actually uh, invented a space propulsion device called the MET thruster that runs on water vapor and it's now flying in space successfully. So you, you I'm, had, I'm having a good year. Well, that's good. Uh, congratulations on the two papers that you sent me. The first one is, uh, the Mars as parent body of C1, what is it, carbonaceous? CI is, they're called CI, carbonaceous chondrites. Yeah, it's it's confusing sometimes. Yeah, it's the hypothesis re-examined in the light of new data. Tell us a little bit about that, John. Okay, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and friends up north, I like to finish what I start. <laughs> 30 years ago, I published a paper where I said um, they were just then finding rocks from Mars. Mm -hmm. And the way you find, uh, if you're walking around in Antarctica or even northern Canada, and you find a rock sitting on the top of the ice, it only can come from some one place, from space. So uh, how do you tell if it's from Mars as opposed to from just a regular meteorite? Yeah or from the moon, there are mm -hmm. meteorites from the moon, uh, or just a piece of earth rock that somehow got tossed out of an airplane. Well, you could check its oxygen isotopes. Oxygen has three stable isotopes. And I don't want to get too technical, but if you look at that isotopic fingerprint in oxygen, everything on Mars lies on a line. Everything on earth lies on a parallel line that's below that line. Mm -hmm. So if you check, the oxygen isotopes, they tell you where it comes from. Oxygen isotopes for Martian rocks are unique. And um, so as it turns out, uh, and I sent you a graph, um, you know, um, it, it's a, if you extend that line, they run into another bunch of meteorites. And those are called CI carbonaceous chondrites. And they're very unique because they are water-soaked clay mm -hmm. and they're 2% organic matter. 
They're full of primordial soup, the stuff of life. And they're very ancient. They're four and a half billion years old. So they match Mars. And I published that 30 years ago. And people got very angry with me. One Why? guy called me up and screamed at me over, well, because the CI were considered kind of sacred meteorites to the meteorite community. The idea that I was putting them on Mars, they thought was was like sacrilege. They, they got very passionate about it. One guy called me up. I had to hold my phone away from my ear because he was screaming at me saying what I had done was not science. And that I published bad, huh? It. Oh, it was. But the real problem is they show that early Mars was warm, wet, and full of organic matter. Life began there. Now, now when you say as on Earth. When you say so, life began there, are you mean that there was life on Mars before life here on Earth? Uh, I think they started about the same time. I think life comes from spores from space. It's called panspermia. Okay. The they pushed back the origin of life on Earth so early that just basically as soon as we had a liquid ocean, there was life in it. This idea that you had primordial soup sloshing around for a billion years and suddenly the first living cell formed with chromosomes and enzymes, mm -hmm. that's, that's an old fairy tale. Now. The Mars, the rock, uh, the spores from space apparently mm -hmm. are out there. They fall onto a planet that has liquid water and warm temperatures like Earth, early Earth did, and life gets a foothold there. Then you ask me, well, where did life really begin then? And I yeah. say, well, I guess it began in a galaxy far, far away a long time ago. In other words, we don't know where life started. T it tell me, start Johnny, there. in your opinion, how different would life have been on Mars compared to life here on Earth? Oh, I think in terms of bacterial life, it'd been very similar. Um, Mars, by the way, is red. If you look at pictures of Earth from space, of the deserts of Earth, they're bright red also. That's because Earth has oxygen in its atmosphere. Mars apparently had lots of oxygen in its atmosphere also. So photosynthesis got going on Mars. Mars was like Mars and Earth were very similar for most of their history. I was the first guy to discover the Martian Ocean too. No one ever gives me credit, but if you look on Wikipedia, Mars Ocean Theory, mm -hmm. I'm reference number one because I was the first person to announce it at a scientific meeting. Now, people don't give me credit because I'm considered a dangerous troublemaker on Mars, Rob. You're talking to a dangerous troublemaker on Mars. Well, you're talking to a dangerous talk show radio host in <laughs> Canada. Good, good. <laughs> I love it. Us dangerous people have yeah. to stick together. We sure do. We sure do. So, uh, you know, they don't want to find life on Mars. I mean, Why not? NASA gives, American NASA gives lip service to looking for life on Mars. And uh, they're like the detective that never can find, uh, you know, the smoking gun or the bloody dagger or anything like that. You know, or you find you find a bloody dagger and he'll say mm -hmm. that dagger is far too long to have been used in this murder. That can't well, be let, the right one. Let me ask you this, John. If sure. they don't want to find life on Mars, why are they wasting all this money getting to Mars to find life on Mars? <laughs> it's 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 part of the absurdity of life. Let me put it to you this way. They okay. landed on Mars a half a century ago in 1976. Very successful two Mars landers. They mm -hmm. tested the soil for life. They found weird chemistry in the soil. It looked like it was alive, but they poo-pooed it. They says, oh, no, that can't be life. So they've had now many, many opportunities, many landings on Mars. They have never tested again for life. And I think I know why now. They know what the result will be.
they will find life on Mars. And who knows? Well, suppose there is a UFO cover up, then there would be a Mars cover up too, right? Makes sense. If, if but, you find life on Mars, this undermines mm -hmm. the UFO cover up. And of course, if you've been watching events here in the United States, you know that we have a big problem. Our military, especially the Air Force, is not being straight with us. Speaking about the cover up, uh, last week there was the uh, let me see the what was it the Congressional Subcommittee on UFOs and UAPs. What was your opinion about that? You know, you had uh, David oh, Rush there. Was, and... I, I worked in Washington D.C. for 15 years mm -hmm. in space uh, defense um, work. I had high security clearances. I heard all of that stuff while I worked there. So I remember muttering about it to my family occasionally and they all thought i was crazy they don't think i'm crazy anymore or else they just think all of washington dc is crazy and that i it's somehow contagious what what would be the big harm in saying if it is true we do have oh. crashed craft we do have extraterrestrials that are living in an underground base that have been marooned here on this planet because we don't have the technology to get them back home <laughs> well uh i wrote a novel i think we've discussed it on your show here called morning star pass the collapse of the ufo cover-up it was a what if science fiction novel Right. Uh, and by the way, I wrote it after going through the nightmare of 9-11 in Washington, D.C. So I knew what a crisis in Washington, D.C. looked like. And of course, oh, my God. Um, oh, it was it was terrible. It was it was it was surreal watching standing there in a big conference room, watching the buildings collapse. And watching the Pentagon being hit by a uh, airliner. And the, I remember the guy standing next to me burst into tears when the first building collapsed because we realized we had just watched thousands of people die. Yeah. And I, I put my arm on his shoulder, his name is Frank, and I, I'd worked with him before. And I said, Frank, get a, get a grip on yourself. This is war. This is like Pearl Harbor all over again. And it was just terrible. So because I'd heard all of these things in Washington, D.C., like they were mm -hmm. testifying. Now, by the way, part of the testimony, I'm, I'm sad to say this, is that, that one of the witnesses talked about people he knew had been harmed and retaliated against for trying to testify at that hearing. And he said there were even reports people have been murdered in order to preserve the UFO cover-up. So this is deadly, deadly serious. And so this is a big problem down to your, your, your buddies down to the south, Rob. Mm -hmm. We got ourselves a big problem. But and but I, I'm still trying to understand, is, is it a matter of the implications that it would have in theological circles, is the Vatican actually part of this conspiracy and cover up? Or oh. you know, like what would be the what if we're sending if we're sending people to the moon in the past, if we're sending these robotic entities to Mars to find life, but we don't want to find life, why are we why don't we just get it over with? Why don't we just say these are the facts? Rob that's the $64 billion question. Really? I don't have the answer to you for you. Um, there's, you know that I published an article where it looks like there's strong evidence there was a thermonuclear holocaust. Why don't we, why don't we hold it there? And, and uh, we've got to take a break. When we come back, sure. let's talk about the thermonuclear war that you believe happened on Mars. John yes. Brandenburg's our very special guest this hour, Explanation. All John's books are available on Amazon.com and Amazon.ca. 
What you're going to hear in the next segment is going to blow your mind. If you think that what you heard this segment blew your mind, you're probably saying, what in the name of heavens can come next? John Brandenburg and I return on the other side of this break. You'll find out. Don't go away. Are you ready to dive into the mysteries of the unknown? Tune into the electrifying X Zone radio TV show hosted by the one and only Rob McConnell. I'm Rob McConnell, and get ready for a mind bending journey through the unexplained phenomenon that surrounds us all. From UFO encounters to cryptids, ghosts, and everything in between, we've got it covered here in the X Zone. Rob McConnell, the seasoned investigator and renowned radio personality, brings you the most compelling interviews with top experts, authors, and experiences from around the world. Each episode is an unforgettable exploration into the depths of the extraordinary. That's right, Exo Nation. Join me every week as we open the door to the supernatural and explore the strange and amazing stories that will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. And it's not just radio anymore. With our groundbreaking TV show, you can now witness the sessions unfold right before your eyes. From chilling reenactments to captivating visuals, prepare yourself for a multimedia experience like never before. With a legacy spanning over two decades, the X-Zone Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, is your ultimate source for mind-blowing entertainment and thought-provoking discussions. Join our growing community of truth seekers as we continue to unlock the world's mysteries. So, why wait? Step into the X-Zone and embark on a journey that will challenge your beliefs, ignite your curiosity, and keep you on the edge of your seat. Remember, X-Zone Nation, the truth is out there, and it's waiting for you right here on the X-Zone Radio and TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Don't miss a minute of the action. Tune in now on your favorite radio station or visit xzoneradiotv.com to join the adventure. The X-Zone Radio TV show with Rob McConnell, where reality meets the unknown. The X-Zone Radio TV show, unraveling the secrets of the universe, one episode at a time. For more information visit www.xzoneradiotv.com. All right, Exxon Nation, this is, this is what I understand so far. My guest this hour is Dr. John Brandenburg, a well-known and highly respected member of the scientific community, done a lot of great work out there. And John, it's always great having you here on the show. So let me see if I've got this straight. Okay, so we don't want there to be life on Mars, but we want to send the space probes to Mars to find out if there's life on Mars or not. So we're spending all this money just to prove that there is life on Mars, but we're not going to tell anybody that all this money has been spent to find life on Mars. I think you're getting close to <laughs> the <Jeez>. situation. <laughs> confused? Oh, yeah. Good, good. You are confused. Yeah. That's good. That's a sign of that's a sign that you're thinking because it's all kind of contradictory. It, here's 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 the elevator, the trip in the elevator version of what okay. has been found. Apparently, Mars was like Earth. It had an ocean. It had life. Perhaps it even developed advanced life. And then, um, Mars was nuked. Apparently. We're talking hydrogen bombs as big as the Empire State Building were apparently dropped from space. And uh, it turned Mars from being a planet like Earth to what it is now. And this happened about a half a billion years ago, by the way. Whoever did it is long gone. But it tells you something about the universe. Uh, this does not appear to have been natural. Mm -hmm. um, the explosions on Mars as I describe in the scientific article, um, 
were airbursts. They were like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They didn't make craters. They exploded in midair because apparently that creates stronger shock waves. And um, it's possible even that they ignited the nitrogen in the air on Mars when they did wow. this. So Mars atmosphere was just lost to space. All there's left is just a tiny, tiny remnant. But there's apparently still life clinging there. So uh, we're not alone, friends. I'm sorry. And it may be a tough neighborhood. The rest of the universe may just be just as screwed up as this planet is, if that were possible. You know, in, in one way, it's kind of comforting to hear it like that. Because that means we're not. Thank you. Yeah, I I, I understand that. Once you get uh, over it, yes, you're right, Rob. Now, how did you find the evidence of this thermonuclear detonation, John? Well, I was working at a nuclear weapons laboratory, mm -hmm. working on fusion and directed energy weapons, and a person in the nuclear weapons community told me that the isotopes on Mars had nuclear weapon signature. I did not know what he meant or what he was, how he knew this or what he was even, you know, I knew what graph he was looking at when he said mm -hmm. that. He just blurted it out. And then suddenly, as sometimes happened at this nuclear weapons lab, we were in unclassified area. He basically just said, pardon me, I have to leave. And he went back into the classified area and uh, so I was left with just that result. And um, we'd been researching the, of course, face on Mars and pyramid at Cydonia Menza. Right. We'd even found another two faces of Mars at a place called Galaxis Chaos. So that's how I found out. And it took me gosh, almost 10 years to find, figure out from the open literature, because they don't publish the results of nuclear weapons tests even now. Uh, as it turns out, there's two places where you find the physics of a hydrogen bomb. One is in hydrogen bombs, of course. The other is in supernova. So I found out the literature of the supernova showed the same isotopes as on Mars. So we know a supernova did not occur on Mars. There's only one other thing that can cause that isotopic fingerprint, and that's the explosion of large nuclear weapons. And they even turned the soil of Mars to glass and then made nitric acid, which etched the glass. So we found that at both sites. And so this is sad news, but the good news, Good news, Rob, is now we know it. We know it. We know there are forces in the universe that are capable of doing this. We have to make sure it doesn't happen here. I, I was I was just going to ask you, how can we make sure that the, the ETs that people here want to communicate with are not the ETs that annihilated Mars and that we may be biting off a little bit more than we want to chew? Well, we can't exactly retreat 20 light years, can we, from them, mm -hmm. like they were the Klingons or something, and we have star our own starships. No, we're here. Um, you know, like, ultimately, you just say, somebody must be looking out for us. Um, and I do believe that. I do believe, by the way, that the future of the human race will look like Star Trek that we'll do fine. We just have to get through this difficult period. Ask Captain Kirk, who's a good Canadian. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Um, if, did he turn to jelly when he found out we weren't alone in the universe? No. He said, let's boldly go. Uh, well, that was after he got his toupee uh, glued onto his head, I guess. Well, it was a good new toupee. Well, I didn't even know he was wearing one until recently. <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, no. Uh, science fiction, by the way, is the way we model the future in our society. So, John, and, what what was the what were, what was the the consensus when you came out with 
the the paper that hey you know what gang there was life on mars yes and it was annihilated by a hydrogen thermonuclear warhead the size of the empire state building and on top of that it was an airburst because that's how it got the best bang for its buck best bang for the buck uh all i can say is the paper has been out there for about a month i've gotten very good re reviews from scientists who have talked to me. Now, there I'm sure there are people who don't like it at all, but they have not challenged me to a debate. Mm -hmm. They have not published anything refuting it. I've gone to several scientific conferences and presented the same data and no one has contradicted me. They. People have said, well, looks like you may have connected the dots. We don't like what you found, but we don't have anything better. The, the, the thing that sticks out as a Thor thumb on Mars is a, a gas called xenon. It's called xenon-129. It's an isotope of xenon, xenon used in flash bulbs and things. Mm -hmm. And um, it's produced by either supernova or uh, hydrogen bomb explosions. And so xenon-129 on Earth, everywhere else in the solar system, it's equal in abundance to xenon-132, uh, another isotope. But on Mars, those are the two most abundant isotopes. But on Mars, there's two and a half times more xenon-129. And I know it sounds very technical, but Basically, that's been a mystery since they discovered it a half century ago, and they have no logical explanation for it until I came along. And then no one has said, Brandenburg, you're wrong because of this or because mm -hmm. of that. No, they haven't said that at all. They have been silent because they know I'm right. They have no argument against it. And that's that's the way you win arguments in the scientific community. Finally, everyone just quits arguing with you. I've challenged people, mm -hmm. critics, to come on shows like this and debate with me, and they won't do it. They're afraid to. So what does NASA say about this? What does NASA say about your finding? Nothing. Ooh. Not a silencio. They have, in fact... A fellow is doing a kind of documentary on this. He contacted Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where I, a nuclear weapons lab where I went to graduate school, and asked them about my research. And they said, oh, we'll get back to you in a week with somebody who can talk to you who's an expert. And then a week later, they called up and said, we have no comment. <laughs> so their comment is no comment. So John, like a scientist taking the Fifth Amendment. So John, let me ask you this: Why are we returning to the moon to use it as a base to get to Mars if we already know what the story is about Mars? We have to go. We have to become space. Rob, we have to become spacefaring. We have to develop space defenses. I'm sorry, but. We can't ignore the universe like we used to. We have to go up to Mars now and find out what actually, what the hell happened up there. I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. I don't know if somebody was using Mars for target practice or if they were targeting somebody on Mars, which is what it looks like. We don't know. We have to go up there, boots on the ground, mm -hmm. find out what happened. And yes. Stand by, John. We've got to take our uh, news break at the bottom of the hour. Exonation, Dr. John Brandenburg, and I will return after this break. Don't go away. And uh, whatever happens, uh, wow, thermonuclear war on Mars. You heard it right here on the Exxon the from our guest this we hour. Know, we, know, we know now. We know. Stand by, John. We'll be right back.
Question, what is the name of the unique blend of coffee you get that has been formulated by a neurologist, a neurobiologist, and a pharmaceutical chemist? Answer, you get Beautiful Mind Coffee, a unique coffee blend that tastes great and has herbal ingredients that your brain will love, and it is not just coffee, it's brain alicious. Dr. Rathbone, Dr. Jang, and Dr. Winslow, the scientific team that created Beautiful Mind Coffee, decided to collaborate on a coffee focusing on brain health. As for those herbal ingredients found in Beautiful Mind Coffee, Dr. Rathbone, Dr. Jang, and Dr. Winslow, utilizing their combined extensive scientific research background, worked with many natural and herbal products until the exact formulation that is found in Beautiful Mind Coffee was created. With a unique scientific formula not found in any other coffee being sold or served, Beautiful Mind Coffee is the only coffee blend that contains three herbal ingredients found to aid in boosting your daily mental clarity and focus. Every cup of Beautiful Mind Coffee contains scientifically formulated amounts of maca root powder, green tea extract, and American ginseng, all supporting good brain health. Taking care of your brain's health now can help delay or prevent the onset of cognitive dysfunction, including dementia, Alzheimer's, and more general memory loss as you get older, just by enjoying the delicious flavor of our roasted coffee and herbal ingredients found exclusively in Beautiful Mind Coffee. Did you know that cognitive dysfunction also refers to deficits in attention, verbal and nonverbal learning, short-term and working memory, visual and auditory processing, problem-solving, processing speed, and motor functioning? For more on Beautiful Mind Coffee, the three scientists who formulated Beautiful Mind Coffee, and more details on the three unique herbal ingredients in Beautiful Mind Coffee, visit www.beautifulmindcoffee.ca. Beautiful Mind Coffee is now available online at Amazon.ca and Amazon.com. To order Beautiful Mind Coffee, visit www.beautifulmindcoffee.ca today. Welcome back, everyone. Dr. John Brandenburg is my guest. His books are available on Amazon.com and Amazon.ca. John, uh, in the previous segment, you briefly mentioned the face on Mars and uh, yes. the pyramid. There's a lot of controversy yes. about that. You know, uh, once well, one flyby, the, the face is there, the pyramids are there, another flyby a couple of years later, poof, nothing. Well, they... Imagine the government is very uncomfortable with discussion of ETs. Mm -hmm. Whether they're flying around making crop circles or dead ones on Mars. Well, uh, then it says, okay, what you thought was a face on Mars is just a weather a crash weather balloon. <laughs> <laughs> And they, they basically sit up nights trying to figure out how to fly over there at just the right sun angle and just the right viewing angle so it looks like nothing. This well, let, 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 me, let me ask you this, John. Let me. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this just crossed my mind. If there was this thermonuclear blast, yes, that airburst that yes. basically destroyed all life on Mars, decimated all the other buildings and all the other structures... Doesn't it make sense that if this really happened, that the face on Mars and the pyramids would also have been destroyed? Oh, I'm sure they were damaged to some degrees, but they're they're pretty tough. I mean, if we had a nuclear war on, on Earth, mm -hmm. God forbid, the Sphinx and the uh, pyramids would still be standing when it was done. And people would fly by a million years from now, look at what was left of Earth. It would look like Mars and say, gee, 
the uh, human beings had a civilization, but it didn't get very far. All they could do is build pyramids and some sphinxes. Yeah, yeah, but John, we don't we don't have the weaponry that would cause a global thermal nuclear war. Oh, the we, site. we could build we could build one of these things, but we don't have it right now. That's what I'm saying. No, no, the, the Russians showed that you could build a hydrogen bomb as big as you wanted. They tested their what what they proudly called the Tsar Bomba up in the Arctic. Tunguska? Uh, it wasn't Tunguska. It was uh, some some island up in the north near the Arctic Ocean. They tested a 50 megaton hydrogen bomb. They, mm -hmm. they could have made it 100 megatons really easy. People who analyzed it said it was a very well-designed bomb. But the Russians were are good at this stuff, believe it or not. And by the way, when I say we have to go up to Mars, boots on the ground, that means you Canadians are coming along. Hey, whether count you us. like it or not, count us in, my friend. Countess countess the in. whole space station consortium, we're all going up there. If if Russia is so good at making these weapons, how come they just can't win the war with Ukraine? Oh. It's a tragedy. I, I actually visited Russia when I was a young man mm -hmm. in 1972. And uh, I went from one end of the country to the other. And I fell in love with the people in the land. I, so I feel very badly about what is happening. Uh, I, it's the mother of all fiascos. I just, I don't know. Well, we're supplying, of course, the Ukrainians with all sorts of very advanced weapons, much more advanced ones than the Russians have. And uh, so it's just a tragedy. I wish they would just have an armistice, settle yeah, this thing. But that makes that makes too much sense, John. It does make too much sense. You're right. It really uh, does. So I, I, um, I think it's a very dangerous situation you have. Any day now we could hear that a nuclear weapon has gone off in Ukraine. Um, but let's just say that I don't think that's going to happen. One of the reasons, by the way, I published the paper that when I did was I wanted to prevent something like that from happening. I wanted people to say, look, we don't want this planet to end up looking like Mars. And um, so, but we must settle our differences on Earth. We must become spacefaring. Mm -hmm. And I do believe with all my heart that the future of the human race will look like Star Trek, complete with Captain Kirk. And then Lieutenant O'Hara, for that matter. And, uh, as, long as, not, as long as it's not Orson and um, Mork from Ork, we've got a good <laughs> chance of succeeding. <laughs> well, you know, uh, and Mork and uh, Mindy, you know, that was also a, well, one of the best movies I think about intelligent life in the universe was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which showed that the rest of the galaxy was just as ruled as much by stupidity as <laughs> things on Earth are. Stupidity reigns at uh, certain levels, doesn't it? It does. And, you know, but the important thing is, we have to go up to Mars. We have to find out what happened up there to prevent it from happening here. People have said, oh, we could send a bunch of robots up there. Well, the people who want to replace all the robots with ast all the astronauts with robots, they want to replace you with robots too, Rob, and your grandchildren. So we don't pay any attention to them. In fact, the people who've been doing the robotic exploration of Mars They've been staring at this data now for 50 years, half a century, and they didn't ever did connect the dots. Never mind why. They just didn't. Now, as far as the base on Mars and the pyramid that is right next to it, mm -hmm. you can go on the net and see recent pictures showing it's it's still it's all still there. They took a picture from the side at morning much different lighting than anyone had seen it before and it looked all messed up well until you look closely at the details so they they have been trying they have been spreading disinformation i'm sorry 
There's but you know, you know, John. The Mars cover up that's a subchapter of the UFO cover up. Yeah, you, you know, John, uh, with all the CGI and all the AI that 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 is capable of creating fascinating photographs, how do we know that the the pictures that we want to believe are real are in fact real? How can we tell the real from the fake when it comes to to photographs from Mars? We. We, we live now, era, Rob, as you know, in the era of the deep fake. Mm -hmm. Guess what half of the AI is being used for? It's for making deep fakes. It's just the human race. It's a bunch of rascals. I'm sorry. And um, all I can say is uh, I concentrated on Mars because there was good data there, published in journals. And um, I was interested in UFOs. Right. But um, I told a friend of mine who was also uh, big into uh, the UFO field, I said, his name is Don Ecker, former oh, yeah. Gray. Good, good guy. Yes. And yes. I told him, I said, Don, the problem with this field is there are no facts there are only reports that's right there's you know at least from mars i could get real data and as much as i criticize the mars community for being kind of slow on the uptake as far mm -hmm. as i'm concerned they produced a lot of really good data what what was it that 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 you saw or that you read that that was that defining moment that Dr. John Brandenburg was going to do the Mars trip, that he was going to study Mars, that Mars was where he should be focusing all his attention? Ah, Rob, that's a very good question. Um, I was working, I went to school at a nuclear weapons lab in the United mm -hmm. States, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, wonderful place. I worked on fusion energy there. Uh, but I went through a nuclear crisis there uh, where people were so tense, you could just sense they were dying of stress as they would walk by you in the hall. Uh, this was during the tail end of the Cold War. It was the Solidarity Uprising in Poland. And our president suggested we were going to send help to the Poles, which we had meant we'd have to send it across East Germany, provoking war with the Russians. So I went through that, and then I went to Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque, and we went through Abel Archer 83, which was a nuclear crisis that was mostly secret. Only people like me who had security clearances knew we were going through it. We were as close to a nuclear war then as we were in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Unreal. Yes, you can look it up. Abel Archer 83. And by the time I got and morale at the lab I worked at just collapsed because the nuclear winter stuff had come out just before the crisis. And guys were saying, what am I going to do, John, if there's a nuclear war? Do I go home and try and get my family and take them to the hills? They'll freeze or starve to death out there after the nuclear war. People would say that to me. And I, I didn't know what to say. I was... I had decided I was just going to go out in the parking lot and have a cup of coffee and watch the whole thing go. Uh, so I felt in despair that we could get in a nuclear war by accident. Mm -hmm. And then I saw the uh, work by DePietro Molinar the day after Christmas on uh, PM Magazine showing the face on Mars, the two different pictures. And suddenly I had hope. I thought, well, if we find a dead civilization on Mars, that means the Russians and I and the Americans will have to get together and we'll go up to Mars together. The Cold War will end. And that's what gave me hope. I thought, if we can turn our attentions outward from Earth, there's hope for the human race. And uh, I think it turned out okay. So do I. Stand by. We have to take our final break. Dr. John Brandenburg and I will be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the X-Zone with yours truly, Rob McConnell. For more information on Dr. John Brandenburg and his books, 
just go to Amazon.com or Amazon.ca. I'm Rob McConnell, Dr. John Brandenburg, and I return after this short break. Don't go away. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. SIMULTV.com. I filmed 16 minutes on March 5th, 1994, 16 minutes of broad daylight UFO activity. The other side, the spirit realm, is a parallel dimension which runs, uh, uh, which coexists with ours. And what spirits are doing is they're sending waves of frequency from that dimension to ours. Uh, the government instituted the truth embargo. The government poured disinformation and misinformation into this field, encouraging hoaxes and any other foolishness. It created a truth vacuum that naturally was going to be filled with theories and, and assertions and other stuff. Uh, the oil oligarchs mm -hmm. and the banks and the, and the people who are making decisions that are leading us down the wrong path. I mean, They've undermined the research, intimidated and threatened witnesses. Uh, the government is responsible for the fact that the, uh, the status of this issue was is not resolved. I'm Rob McConnell, host and executive producer of the X-Zone radio show. Now we are set to bring the amazing world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology to broadcast TV and online video with the development of X-Zone TV. X-Zone TV will now bring our loyal listeners and new viewers face to face with the most controversial and well-known personalities in the field of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. From scientist to theorist, astronauts to adventurers, celebrities, pundits, advocates, and naysayers, they'll all join our rapid-fire TV broadcast, interactive discussion, and debate. Interest in the paranormal and parapsychology has never been more intense, and it continues to grow. The truth is out there, so take a deep breath and join us as we step into the light. For more information about Exxon TV, please contact me, Rob McConnell, directly at these coordinates, Rob McConnell, at exxonetv.com. From thermonuclear war on Mars, or I should say a thermonuclear explosion, we don't know if it was a war or not, do we, John? To uh, the well, face on Mars pyramids, uh, boy, we've covered quite a bit in the first uh, 45 minutes of the show. And I, I want to thank you so much for everything you do, John, and, and for getting the truth out there. How do you deal with skepticism, my friend? Oh, um, I just try and, I'm just trying to do my job as a scientist and do it well. Um, I'm 
pledge to defend this country and its people, and by extension, the entire human race, mm -hmm. Western Alliance. Um, we're going to do okay, Rob. We're going to do okay. I believe Rob, you, John. Thank you for, so much for having me on your show. It's always a great um, pleasure, John. Uh, we uh, th this information, stuff, by the way, coming out. So. Well, you know that I want to hear it as soon as it's out. Okay, so, you know. as, soon as, as soon as it appears, I'll shoot you a line. Um, I want to just end with one happy note. Uh, as you can imagine, I've been looking at this problem for a long time. And of course, mm -hmm. the impact of, uh, and I'm, I'm religious. I'm just an Episcopalian. I was a fundamentalist when I was young. My parents joined a fundamentalist church, and I learned the Bible really well. Uh, the Bible's written in Greek, by the way. That's its original language, the New Testament. And it's interesting, when you read it in the Greek, or you understand the Greek words that are used, mm -hmm. uh, like the King James Version, every time you would almost 99% of the time we encounter the word world in the New Testament, as in God so loved the world, or go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that word that is translated as world is the Greek word cosmos. And it means exactly now what it meant then to the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks were philosophers. They'd actually already... 200 years before Jesus, they had actually figured out the solar system. You'll find it interesting, too, by the way. The guy who did it is, was a guy named Aristarchus. He said, the Earth moves around the sun and all the other planets with it. And the other stars are actually other suns with planets around them, and people on them. You know what happened to him? He was locked up. Oh, geez. <laughs> by the temple... He, the priesthood of the temple of Jupiter and the temple of Mars got him arrested. Pericles, he was in Athens, ancient Athens, and Pericles, the great statesman of Athens, had to go down to the jail in the middle of the night, get him out of jail, and get him on the next boat out of the harbor. And he told him, don't come back here if you're going to talk like that. It disturbs people. But the God... Nothing has changed. Only our awareness has changed. The stars have not changed. We have not changed. God has not changed. The Bible hasn't changed. We're going to do fine. We're going to do just fine. Trust in God, guts, and guns. Believe me. As Send well the as, Mounties up to Mars. They'll know what to do. Because they always get their man. They always get their man. John, uh, as always, time goes by so fast when you're with me, my friend. I, uh, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for Pleasure bringing the truth out there. And I'll always be on your show. Thanks, pal. And I look forward to the next time you and I meet here in the Exxon. Until then, take care of yourself. My very best to your family. And uh, always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light, my friend. Live long and prosper, Rob. Or in the words of the immortal Mark, Nanu, Nanu. Nanu, Nanu. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Exo Nation, I'll be back on the other side of this break with the news as we continue here in the Exo from our broadcast God station. You, God bless whole, you too, John. A wonderful nation up there. Thanks, pal. Bye -bye. Dr. John Brandenburg has been our guest. His books are available on Amazon.com and Amazon.ca. We'll be back. Whatever you do, don't go away. <laughs>